This is lesson 11 in our Calculus 3 series, Functions of Several Variables. Before we define functions of several variables, let's go back to what we know about functions in two-dimensional space. When we have y is a function of x, what we're saying is that for every x value in the domain, there's one and only one corresponding y value. That's a definition of y being a function of x, right? So for example, y equals x squared is a function, but x squared plus y squared equals one is not a function because here for the same x value, you could have two different y values. Now, so far what we've seen in three-dimensional space is the three-dimensional equivalent of graphs like circles in 2D. Because what we've seen are surfaces and we haven't talked about whether or not they're graphs of functions. We've just been talking about these quadric surfaces, these cylinders, but we haven't talked about whether or not they're graphs of functions. Now let's talk about the definition of a function of two variables. z is equal to f of x and y is a function of two variables if for every pair x, y in the domain d, there is one and only one corresponding z value. So very similar to the definition we had in 2D, for every input that you have, this time the input is a pair, x comma y, for every input that you have, you have a unique output, you have a unique real value. So keep in mind here that our domain is now a subset of two-dimensional space. It's a subset of the xy plane. It's all the pairs xy that can be put into the function f. So there's two input values, one output value. And as we said, the domain is a region in R2. The range is a set in R. So for example, let's take a look at f of x, y equals 2x minus 3y plus 5. Notice that f of x, y gives us our z value. So this is z equals 2x minus 3y plus 5. And we've seen this kind of equation before. This is a plane. So what's the domain here for this function? Well, are there any restrictions on x or y or the combination of x and y? No, there aren't any restrictions here. We can plug in any pair x, y. So the domain here is r2. Let's take a look at another example. f of x, y is equal to radical 4 minus x squared minus y squared. First, let's talk about what kind of function this is, and then we'll talk about the domain. We notice that if we let f of x, y equals z, we're here, and we can square both sides, and we recognize that this is the sphere of radius 2 centered at the origin. So with that, we have an idea of what kind of x and y values we're expecting to be able to plug into this function. But really what we want to do is to go back up to the definition of the function and set some equalities or inequalities based on the definition of the function. For example, we know that anything under a radical needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So that's where we're going to start when we're finding the domain. We're going to say, 4 minus x squared minus y squared must be greater than or equal to 0. And then if we move things around, we're going to get 4 is greater than or equal to x squared plus y squared, or x squared plus y squared is less or equal to 4. Now we know in two-dimensional space that x squared plus y squared equaling 4 is the circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. So now we're talking about the circular disk of radius 2 centered at the origin. That's the domain. That's the region of points in R2 that we can plug into this function. So graphing that just in two dimensions looks like this. But lots of times we'll graph the two-dimensional domain in three-dimensional space so that we can then graph the surface with it as well. So let's do that here. And I'm sketching that graph using traces, right? I'm using my trace here when y is equal to 0. And now I'm using my trace here when x is equal to 0. And that helps define the shape of that surface. We could also use a trace at, say, z equals 1. And so the purple other surface traces. And we can draw the hemisphere and the domain in the same three-dimensional space. Now notice I just said hemisphere, and up here I was saying sphere. So this equation defines the sphere of radius 2 centered at the origin. However, we only have z values that are greater than or equal to 0. So really what we have is 
the hemisphere of radius 2 centered at the origin. We have the top half of that sphere. And I also just want to write this domain in a more formal way. So essentially this is our domain, but let's see what that looks like in more formal notation. The domain is the set of x, y in R2 such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4. And that's the formal notation for our domain. Now let's take a look at another example f of x, y is equal to radical x minus y plus 3 over 5 minus y plus ln of x plus 15. Find the domain and sketch in R2. So notice that they're saying sketch in R2. This must mean sketch the domain. right? If they wanted us to sketch the surface, that would be in R3. Now notice that this function has all the things we have to look out for in the domain. It has an even root, so we know whatever's underneath the even root needs to be greater than or equal to zero. It has a fraction, so we know whatever's in the denominator needs to not be equal to zero. And it has a log, so we know whatever's inside the logarithm needs to be strictly positive. So let's take a look at what that looks like. We need x minus y to be greater than or equal to zero, and at the same time, we need five minus y to not be zero, and at the same time, we need x plus 15 to be greater than zero. So let's take a look at what each of those restrictions individually looks like on two-dimensional space, and then we'll put them all together to get the domain of our function. The domain here is going to be the intersection of each of these sets. So let's take a look at x minus y is greater than or equal to zero. If we move the y over, we're saying x is greater than or equal to y. Well, we know the line x equals y is this diagonal line here. So how do we know that it's this part of the plane that gets shaded for x greater than or equal to y? Well, we take a test point. For example, this point over here might be 5 comma 0. The x is 5, the y is 0. In that case, is 5 greater than or equal to 0? Yes, so this is the side that you shade. And for every point in this region, the x-coordinate will be bigger than its corresponding y-coordinate. So this is our region x greater than or equal to y. Now at the same time, we need 5 minus y to not equal 0, which means y cannot equal 5. So here we're talking about the entire two-dimensional plane, except this line where y is equal to 5. So I'm subtracting that from our set. Now just looking at x plus 15 greater than 0, that means x needs to be greater than negative 15. So here's negative 15. We've got a dotted line here, and we're shading everything to the right. But now these are the individual domains for these function parts, but, but our domain needs to be the intersection of all of these sets. So let's put together all of these conditions and see what it looks like. Just writing it down looks like this. The domain here is the set of x, y pairs in R2 such that x is greater than or equal to y, y is not equal to 5, and x is strictly greater than negative 15. And putting those sketches together looks like this. So if you're sketching this by hand, you're going to have a dotted line here, a solid line here, and a dotted line here. Now let's talk about graphing functions of two variables. We already know how to graph functions that define quadric surfaces, and we learned how to do that using traces in Lesson 8. So for example, the hemisphere above we graphed using traces, and for example something like g of x and y equals 2x squared plus y squared plus 4, that's an elliptic paraboloid. We know how to find the sketch using traces. And also something like h of x and y equals y squared minus x squared plus 2. That's a hyperbolic paraboloid. We know how to sketch that as well using traces. Now, more generally, to graph any z equals f of x, y surface, we're going to use level curves. And level curves are traces of the form z equal constant. So whereas in the quadric surfaces, we were also doing x equal constant and y equal constant, for more general surfaces given by the function z equals f of x, y, we're going to use the z equals constant traces, also called level curves. So for example, let's take a look at this function, f of x, y equals e to the negative x, y. And remember that f of x, y gives us our z value. 
So the first thing we notice here is that z is always going to be positive. Remember, e to any power, always a positive number. So when I'm making my level curves, I can't set z equal to zero and expect to get anything, and I can't set z to anything negative. So recognizing that, I'm going to start with z equals 1. So I let 1 equal e to the negative xy. Taking the natural log of both sides, I get ln1 equals negative xy. That gives me 0 equals xy. So this means either x is going to be 0 or y is going to be 0. So x can be 0 and y can take any value, or y can be 0 and x can take any value. And remember, with either of these, z is always going to be 1. So let's take a look at the first one. We have z equals 1, x equals 0, y can be anything. That's this line going across parallel to the y-axis, just one unit above. Similarly, z equals 1, y equals 0, x can take any value, is this line parallel to the x-axis, just one unit above. Now let's take a look at what we get when z is equal to 2. So we set 2 equals e to the negative xy. So ln2 is equal to negative xy. xy is equal to negative ln2. And we have y equals negative ln2 over x. Now what does this graph look like? Well, we know what y equals negative 1 over x looks like, right? y equals negative 1 over x looks like this. Now we're just scaling by a factor of ln2. So what is that going to look like in our three-dimensional space? Well, notice we're at the height of z equals 2, so everything is happening at this height, z equals 2. And remember that this is our first quadrant here when x and y are positive. That corresponds to this. So the quadrants that we have here are going to be here and say here. So that's what those curves look like in three-dimensional space at the height z equals 2. Now let's take a look at z equals 3. Very similar graph, just a different multiple here. So now at the height z equals 3, we have something like this. Okay, let's also take some fractional values for z. We know we can't go 0 or negative, but we can certainly take a look at what happens when z is less than 1. So let's take a look at z equals a half. For z equal 1 half, we have 1 half equals e to the negative xy. Take the ln of both sides. Notice here that this is ln 1 minus ln 2, so this is negative ln 2. So that xy is equal to ln2, and now we have y equals ln2 over x. So now we're going to be graphing in quadrants, say, 1 and 3 in two-dimensional space. So in our graph, we're at the height of z equals a half. We're going out, though, the same units we went here. It's a little bit hard to see that this one is just low down at z equals a half, but pushed back. So we've got something like this. So we have some idea of what this surface looks like. And our computer generated graph looks like this. And here we can see it with the level curves as well. Now it's also common not only to look at the level curves and plot them in three-dimensional space, but to take a look at those level curves all flattened down into two-dimensional space, and that's called a contour plot. So those same level curves flattened down into two-dimensional space looks like this. It's like the top view of all of those level curves. And this two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional surface is very useful for us. Let's take a look at another contour plot and see what we can say about its surface. And now notice that each of these level curves are labeled. 
So this is z equals negative 0.1, z equals negative 0.2, negative 0.3. Similarly, z equals 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. If we just had the contour plot without any z labels on them, we would have some information about the surface, but we wouldn't be able to actually sketch the surface because we wouldn't know at what z levels any of the curves belong. So from here, let's take a look at sketching the three-dimensional surface. The first thing I want to do is take a look at z equals zero. That looks like this line here, and that looks like the line y equals x. So that's the line y equals x when z equals zero. Let's see what else we have. So now we've got these circles. When z is equal to 0 0.1, we've got like a huge circle. They're getting smaller and smaller as the z levels rise. And notice, what's the location of these circles? These are where the x is positive and the y is negative. So that's happening where x is positive and y is negative. So that's happening in here. So when z is equal to 0 0.1, got some really big circle here. When z is equal to 0.2, and z is 0.3. And it looks like we have this hill happening here. Well, let's take a look at what's happening on the other side of the graph. For these negative z values, it looks like we're going to have a ditch on the other side of the graph. So let's sketch that in as well. Here we have our level curves going down to the negative direction, and we have our, uh, our minimum here. So it looks like we have a mountain here, and it looks like we have a ditch on this side. Let's take a look at what that looks like um, generated by our computer software. Now one thing I want to point out here with our contour map, notice that when the level curves are very close together, what this is saying is that with little movement in X and Y, you're getting a lot of change in Z. That's telling us where we're going to have our steepest parts of the surface. And I tried to sketch that in here, and you can see it a lot better on this surface here. It's much steeper here than it is on the other side of the hill and the other side of the ditch, right? Much steeper here. Now let's take a look at a matching exercise. We want to match the contour plots with their equations and their surfaces. I think here it's going to be easiest to start by matching the contour plots with their surfaces and then going to the equations. So when I look at these surfaces, I notice that two of them have this saddle-like thing going on, and two of them are going to have like circular slices. So I recognize that in my contour plot, I've got two that look like they have circular curves, and the others are going to match up with the saddle-like surfaces. So let's take a look at the circle surfaces first. And what we were just saying about the steepness of the surface based on the closeness of the level curves, that's what's going to make the distinction here between the contour plots for these two surfaces. So notice here, our surface gets steepest where x and y get closest to zero. But notice here, we've got some flatness, some steepness, then a little more flatness and a little more steepness, a little more flatness, a little more steepness. So this first contour plot, where the lines are close together every so often, is definitely going to represent this last surface here. So we're going to match these two up, and we'll talk about their equation in a minute. And with that, let's take a look at this circular contour plot here to go with this surface. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, we said this surface is getting steeper and steeper as x and y get closer to zero. That's what's happening here as well. The level curves are getting closer together as x and y get closer to zero. So these match up. Now while we're talking about these surfaces that have these circular level curves, let's take a look at the equations and see if we can make the connection between the equations 
and the surfaces or level curves. Now when I look at these equations, I notice that I have an x squared plus y squared here and an x squared plus y squared here. Remember that x squared plus y squared equals r squared is the equation for a circle in two-dimensional space. So when we set z to be constant here, for example, let's set z to be 1, for example. We have 1 equals ln of x squared plus y squared. And writing that in exponential form says e equals x squared plus y squared. That's going to be a circle of radius radical e. So we know that this equation is going to have circular level curves. Now let's take a look at this one as well. We could have 1 equals cosine x squared plus y squared. And that says x squared plus y squared is going to equal 0 or 2 pi or 4 pi. And for all of these circles, we're getting a z value of 1. So notice the difference here in these two equations. When we set z to be constant here, we're only getting one circle. When we set z to be constant here, we're going to get multiple circles. So which of the surfaces looks like it has that property? It looks like this surface is definitely the one that has the periodicity because it looks like when z is equal to a constant, we'll get multiple circles. And we notice with this surface, when z is equal to a constant, we're only going to get one circle. Now let's take a look at these saddle type surfaces. So how are we going to tell the difference between these saddle surfaces when they look kind of similar and their contour plots are quite similar as well? Let's take a look at what happens when we take a z slice. If we take a z slice here, maybe z is negative, taking a z slice here looks like we're going to get a curve here, one back here, and then one also back here for the same z equals a constant. Looks like we're going to get three level curves. Notice the slice that I was looking at looked like it was a negative z value. So what happens when we go to a positive z value and do a z slice up here? Well then our curves are going to be in a different spot, but we're still going to have three curves. One here, one here, and one around here. So now the negative z values give us three curves, the positive z values give us three curves, but in different regions. So this contour plot here has six curves going around. And it would make sense that three of these curves are going to go together for negative z values, and the other three are going to go together for positive z values. So this surface is going to match up with this contour plot. If we count the number of curves we're going to get for, here, for this surface, we'll notice we'll get four curves for every z slice. And so this surface is going to go with this contour plot. Now let's take a look at their equations and see what we can find from that. If we set z equal to zero here, we get xy squared minus x to the third, factoring out an x, we see that z can equal 0 here when x is equal to 0 or where y squared is equal to x squared, which says that y is plus or minus x. So for this surface, the only way we could get z equal to 0 is when x equals 0 or y is equal to plus or minus x. Here, we can factor out an xy and get y squared minus x squared. So here we're saying x is equal to 0, or y is equal to 0, or y is equal to plus or minus x. So this surface has the value of z equals 0 when x equals 0, when y equals 0, or when y is equal to plus or minus x. So the difference here is when y is equal to 0. So let's go back up to our surfaces and see when y is equal to 0, what's happening on each one of those graphs. Now when y is equal to 0 here, we're talking about the xz plane. So if we intersect the xz plane with this surface, what are we going to see? Are we going to get a z equals 0 line? It looks like we will. What's happening here? 
When y is equal to zero, that's the xz plane. If we intersect the xz plane with this surface, it definitely looks like we're going to get a curve that is down here. So y equals zero, resulting in z equals zero, is happening with this first graph here. And so that's this. And this plot goes with this equation. And we've completed our matching exercise. Now let's take a look at functions of three variables. We can say w is equal to f of x, y, z. Here we have three input variables. So f is taking three-dimensional space into, we have one output variable into one-dimensional space. So f is going from R3 to R. That means the domain of this function would have to be some subset of three-dimensional space. Now since we can't graph in four dimensions, we're not going to be able to sketch graphs of these functions, but what we can do is take a look at the domain. Remember we said the domain is a subset in three-dimensional space, so we can get a sketch of the domain in three-dimensional space, and we can also take a look at level surfaces and level surfaces are the three-dimensional version of level curves. So for example, W equals F of X, Y, Z could model the temperature in a room. Could be warmer near the door, it could be cooler near the air conditioner, right? So you could have different warm and cool spots. So the temperature in the room would depend on the point in space that you're at. So temperature would depend on the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the point you're talking about. Let's take a look at this function, f of x, y, z is equal to tan of x over 10 plus ln of x squared plus y squared minus 4 plus 2 over 4 minus z squared. There's a lot going on here. Let's talk about its domain. We can see right away that we've got some restrictions on domain because we have a tangent function and we know tangent doesn't exist at odd multiples of pi over 2. We know that we have a log here, and whatever we plug inside a log needs to be strictly positive. And we have a fraction, and so its denominator cannot equal zero. So we have three conditions here. We know that x over 10 cannot equal odd multiples of pi over 2. We know that x squared plus y squared minus 4 must be strictly positive. And we know that 4 minus z squared cannot equal zero. So let's see what that tells us about our domain x over 10 cannot be an odd multiple of pi over 2. So multiplying both sides by 10, that tells us x cannot be an odd multiple of 5 pi. So x can't be positive or negative 5 pi, can't be positive or negative 15 pi, x can't be positive or negative 25 pi, etc. We also know that x squared plus y squared minus 4 has to be positive, so x squared plus y squared needs to be greater than 4. That means the set of points that we can plug into this function need to be outside the cylinder. x squared plus y squared equals 4. We also know that z cannot equal plus or minus 2. So let's try to get an idea of what subset of three-dimensional space we're talking about here for our domain. So starting with the space outside of the cylinder, I've drawn my cylinder here, x squared plus y squared equals 4. And so I'm starting with all of the points outside of that cylinder. But we need to take away where x is positive or negative 5 pi, positive or negative 15 pi, positive or negative 25 pi, etc. Those are going to be parallel planes at the different x values. We also need to take away from this set z equals positive or negative 2. And those are going to be horizontal planes at z equals positive and negative 2. So even though it's difficult to sketch this subset of three-dimensional space, by sketching in these planes in the cylinder, we have an idea of what uh, subset we're talking about, of what our domain looks like in three-dimensional space. And that's as much as we'll do with this function, but let's take a look at another. Let's talk about level surfaces. Just like we set f of x, y equal to a constant and looked at level curves, now we could set f of x, y, z equal to a constant and look at level surfaces. So for example, if we take a look at f of x, y, z equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, if we set this equal to a constant, then we're talking about 1 equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, or 4 equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, or 9 equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared. These are spheres of the different radii. And if we set the function just equal to 0, then we just get the point at the origin. But just like we made a plot of our level curves, we can talk about this whole collection 
of level surfaces. So when the function is set equal to zero, we're just talking about this point. When the function is set equal to nine, for example, we've got our sphere of radius three. and that's one of our level surfaces. When the function is set equal to four, we have our sphere of radius two. And when the function is set equal to one, our sphere of radius one. And I think you get the idea. So these are our level surfaces for the function. And for this function, you could think of it like layers of an onion. At any radius, we have a sphere that is a level surface for this function. And with this, we'll end our lesson on functions of several variables.